Please welcome Chloe Servino, staff writer, Forbes Media, Scott Beck, president, Bex Hybrids, Barry Knight, senior vice president, Indigo Agriculture, Myron Stein, president, Stein Seed Company, and Mike Vandalot, executive vice president and chief operating officer, Winfield United. Good morning. I want to start this conversation with talking about the biggest gains in the seed industry that has, that has made recently. Um, what a seed grower chooses each season, sorry. <laughs> what seed a grower chooses each season is the biggest decision they'll make because it's the biggest single cost. So Mike, I want to start with you. Seeds can now produce around 500 bushels of corn per acre. What excites you about what, how the seed industry has evolved and where are the gaps still? Yeah, great question. So, you know, if you take a look at last four years, best growing season in the U.S., 170 bushel. Take a look at national corn growers, and last four years, national corn growers winner has averaged 534. So now we have a 364 bushel gap between what average U.S. corn yield does and what the potential is. So at the end of the day, the plant breeders have gotten ahead of the agronomists. And you know, for agronomists to be able to nurse that high-end yield potential, it's about being able to identify the opportunities to put incremental inputs on in season and go get more of that 360 bushel. So the egg technology that's being talked about at this conference here is really the gap in the market to get the agronomists equal to where the plant breeders are today. Now Scott and Myron here are both from two of the biggest privately held and family run seed firms in the country. What are you both putting your research dollars towards and how does that translate to what the growers will soon be able to put in place in the fields? Whoever wants to start. So we uh, have a corn breeding program and we also have a trait conversion laboratory and greenhouse, greenhouse space so we can, uh, I guess, more effectively take the genetic part of yield gain and improve that. There's other, there are also the environmental part, genetic by environment to create ultimate yield. And so on the environmental part, we're putting research dollars into what we call practical farm research. So that's research beyond just the seed, but it's about some of the technologies that we're seeing here today, uh, from equipment to fertilizer to cover crops, many other things that we're testing in order to help farmers succeed on that environmental part. Um, so Stein, we're a breeding company primarily, and so nearly everything that we focus on is on conventional breeding. So everything that we do is trying to figure out how to make our program larger, uh, faster, and more cost-effective. At the end of the day, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're paid by, we're paid to make genetics for the industry. And Myron, can you tell us specifically more about LibriLink GT27? Yeah, ab absolutely. So on, on the soybean side, uh, today a, a big issue is, of course, yield and then weed control, cost-effective weed control. And there's a number of herbicide trait platforms out there today. Uh, prior to 2009, for instance, there was only <coughs> one. And today you have, you have, you have a number of them. And um, two of them, which are very interesting, one's called GT27, which is glyphosate with an HPPD on it. And then one is called Liberty Link GT27, which is glufosinate glyphosate with an HPPD on it. And these two trait platforms uh, represent uh, something very, very new that the industry has never seen before. Um, the HPPD side in particular is interesting, A, because there may be a herbicide to, to, to link up to that, and then uh, uh, C, uh, or B, um, the, there's a 
potential carryover issue with HPPD chemistries um, from corn, from corn herbicides, which soybeans are very sensitive to that, and these trait platforms allow soybeans to, to grow through that issue. And that potentially will bring one of the largest uh, values that we've seen in a trait platform for, for growers today. So it's got a huge potential, but it's gotten ensnared in trade wars with China? Okay, repeat, I'm sorry, the echo, I couldn't hear you very well. <laughs> we can't really hear very well. <laughs> um, it's gotten ensnared in the trade wars with China. It's, it's kind of in flux. Um, oh, oh no, it has, has nothing to do with that. The, the, uh, the, the HPPD side, or the chemistry you're talking about, that's strictly an EPA issue here in the United States. Uh, both of these trait platforms have worldwide approval okay. at this time. There is another trait platform, which maybe you're talking about, called Enlist E3, which still needs Chinese approval. And yeah, I tell you, the trade war is slowing that down a little bit. <laughs> and I want to go to Barry from Indigo. Um, your startup has become one of the best funded in ag tech startups in America. It just raised $250 million in a Series E. And so tell us how Indigo uses microbiology to improve yield and protect crops against stressors. Uh, thank you, and thank you for giving us this opportunity. As, as Mike described, that the gap between where average yields are and their potential is a function of management or a stress. And so some of those stresses we're addressing with the microbiome, whether it be uh, a drought stress, uh, a fungal stress, or uh, an insect. There's probably a fungus or a bacteria already in nature to address those problems. And so that's what our company does. And so tell us about the marketplace. Um, I have some stats here. So they just launched this, and growers have entered $6 billion worth of grain inventory, and buyers have bid more than 4,000 times, totaling more than $2 billion in transactions so far. So how is this adding to the tools that growers have? And tell us about how Indigo's um, view of the future of seed is intertwined with uh, decommoditization of agriculture. So when we launched uh, a product in wheat in Kansas last year, interacting with the farmers and the mill, we understood there was an opportunity to, correct, to connect a farmer directly with the mill. Uh, many mills want a customized, uh, they want a variety, a specific variety at a specific uh, uh, protein. And uh, it's difficult to go to a, a place where it's commingled and find that. And so our idea was to connect that grower with the mill, and that's what we've done. And so as we look forward and into the future, which is, which is now, uh, it's connecting uh, growers' produce with either a mill or a consumer that it, it was produced in the way that, uh, that that mill or that consumer wanted. And so how something is produced is important to consumers, and consumers are willing to pay a premium for that. Uh, in animal ag, we all uh, go to the grocery store and we see certified Angus beef. It's, it's approved by the USDA, either choice, select, or prime, the same way its neighbor on the shelf is, except it deserves a premium. And we see that in, uh, as we customize corn, rice, wheat, whichever crop we're working in. Opening the next question to the group, how do you think the recent mergers of Bear Monsanto and Dow DuPont will impact the seed sector? What opportunities do you see opening up? Well, um, obviously, difficult times in agriculture. You know, simple math, it takes twice as much money to pay for your inputs at 350 corn than it does seven. So declining commodity prices, compressing margins for everybody. Being able to amortize your research costs over a much bigger footprint, I think is going to enable uh, at least the three or four companies actually left aggressively breeding um, to be able to compete 
uh, and still spend the dollars that are needed to, uh, to continue this high-end yield increase that we're currently seeing. So I see it as a favorable thing because I think that it'll enable the same kind of investment that we're seeing in plant breeding to stay. I I, I tell you that uh, I think the mergers will bring some innovation from those companies. Um, they'll have some resources maybe they didn't have before. Uh, I also think that uh, those mergers bring opportunity for privately held companies like uh, Bex and ourselves, for instance, um, smaller startups that are just uh, getting getting their feet on the ground uh, to, to bring that technology in. I, I, I think it's a good thing for the, for the industry. I think with the Bayer's purchase of Monsanto, there was not a lot of overlap in what was being purchased, and uh, with the exception of Liberty Link, which had to be divested to BASF. Uh, so I think that just created a, you know, the largest company in the world from an agricultural standpoint for the input side. With Dow and DuPont coming together, I think that has the potential to be a stronger competitor than what Pioneer was when they were owned by DuPont. Uh, the reason I say that is that with Dow and DuPont coming together to form Corteva, and eventually by next year, June, I believe, uh, Corteva will be an independent, agriculturally focused company. And so I think that has the potential uh, to be a stronger player because they won't have the oversight of a larger DuPont or Dow Chemical uh, making decisions at the higher level that affect agricultural in the, f in the field. Yeah, I think it's interesting that they felt the need to merge. Uh, they must see something on the uh, horizon that thought a bigger was better. I, I Like Myron, I believe that this is an opportunity for startups to, uh, uh, to impact the seed business, and I think we're seeing that. Uh, we're seeing investment on the wheat side, wheat seed side, uh, <coughs> You're seeing CRISPR technology stand up everywhere, and so I think it's a, it's a brilliant opportunity for startups. So what's one solution that, you know, maybe a product or otherwise, that growers can put to work in the fields today that you think is currently underused? One of the areas that we've invested heavily in because the overall industry has been investing heavily in is seed treatment, and particularly on the biological side. Uh, we actually put 13 different products on our corn and six different products on our soybeans as seed treatments. And so that mix, and we talk about it being a toolbox. In other words, that seed is equipped for whatever conditions it's going to encounter when it's put in the ground, whether it needs a fungicide, insecticide, uh, nutritional product or a biological product to help it create a healthier environment around the seed. There's been a lot of investment globally in that area and we're focused on helping farmers uh, to make sure they get the most out of every seed when it's put in the ground. Yeah, so I'm, I believe it's egg technology. You know, <clears throat> you know, I was talking before about the 500 bushels. You know, you can't put 500 bushels of inputs on pre-plant which is the way farming works today. If it turned uh, dry, obviously you lose a lot of money. Worse yet, it would turn wet and leach 500 bushels worth of input into the groundwater. So the paradigm shift at you know, trying to get 300, 400 bushel corn is planting your crop and then seeing what the weather is like first four or five weeks of the growing season and understanding which fields which spots in the field that you have an opportunity to put more incremental inputs on. So certainly, egg technology, helping farmers use big data analysis and predictive models to understand where they can get a return on those in-season images or in-season predictive models, and uh, on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis, understanding where they can go get 300 or 325, make the right investment, and most importantly, get a return on investment that they make that's predictable. Yeah. I'd, I'd tell you that um, on the corn side, for instance, there's a number of new genetics out there from a number of companies that can, high, that can handle higher populations. 
Um, however, when you do that, you, there's a lot of management involved to make that work. And I think that's probably one thing that growers today aren't focused enough on trying to figure out, A, which genetics can handle these higher populations, which will help the yield on my, on my ground, and then B, how do I manage those, those genetics properly with the technologies which, which everyone's talking about up here. Yeah, I, I agree that it's, a, it's around information. Uh, the, I think the lowest hanging fruit is uh, what day to plant, uh, how much to plant, and what to plant. And uh, planting date by itself is, uh, is one of the largest drivers in, in, in ag, and we don't do that well across the nation on, on planting which field to plant. Uh, so I think it's around information. Well, we've got a great panel here. So are there any questions from the audience? We have some uh, runners going around. Over there. Hi, uh, thanks for all the insights. Um, you were talking about the yield gap and how do we get farmers to get more yield. We, we're at $3.50 corn, right? Is more yield really the solution for farmers? Because, because we have been increasing yield for years and years and years, and now we're at a point where corn is not worth much. So the question is, shouldn't we help farmers get more out of what they're actually producing today? You know, so, so actually, I, I think you got to, again, about how you apply technology and get the genetics out of the high yield. So, so um, what the predictive models are saying is that if you get your corn planted early, have the right moisture, the right heat units to drive early biomass. If you, for example, put 40 pounds of nitrogen on those spots, you'll get another 40 bushel. And those 40 bushel only cost you 40 cents. Similar with fungicide, if you have uh, hybrids that respond to fungicide and you have a disease year and you put the fungicide on, you can get 25 bushels for a $25 investment and those bushels are only a dollar. So if you think about that whole acre and taking that 65 bushel that costs you 65 cents and amortize that over the whole acre, you know, you're actually bringing down your inputs per bushel and you're, you're optimizing profitability but if you even think about sustainability, you know, what's the most sustainable bushel? I think there's a case to be made that the definition for the most sustainable bushel is the bushel with the lowest inputs per bushel. So when Mother Nature gives you the opportunity on the best soil types in the world to go grab 300 bushel, that 300 bushel, if you do it right, actually has lower inputs per bushel in it than bushels produced anywhere else. So uh, I appreciate your question, and it's one we deal with in ag every year. What we're focused on as a company is the decommoditization of those crops. Can we separate corn out of simply number two yellow dent corn? Either how it was produced or the actual uh, value that's created in a, in a protein or something else in there. And uh, if we don't do that, I, we're going to be on this, this commodity world for forever. In, in rice, there's different varieties that have different values, the same way in wheat. Yeah, I think it's, you know, continues to be an important realization that yes, corn is 350. And the last time we were in this range was 10 years ago. But in that 10-year range, we've had a global increase in corn at 40%, and yet we're back to 350 corn because productivity has actually kept up to demand. And though we're back at 350 corn again, the yield per acres have gone much higher. And in terms of farmer income, you know, they're, they're still doing okay. The good farmers. Another question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, a few of you mentioned the opportunities you see for smaller startup businesses getting started, um, given the recent mergers of Dow DuPont, Monsanto Bayer. 
Could you give some examples of, or specific clarification on why you see that new opportunity? Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, so one of the things that we've created in Indigo is a channel for startup companies to get their products tested across the United States on growers. And once that was set up, uh, companies from all over the United States called and said, hey, we'd like to get our, our products to address, uh, can we understand uh, a, a water sensor or a, uh, a different uh, microorganism that they're working with and they hadn't had access to the marketplace and we provide that channel. And so uh, it's, it's, it's a plethora of, of startups that are interested in getting into ag. I, I could talk in each space, but it's broad. We have a, a software platform that we created to help farmers to uh, collect and safely store and use their farm's data. We call it Farm Server. And so there's a number of companies that are interested in partnering with us, uh, some startup companies, some existing companies, to be able to uh, tie into that platform and to use that service as a way of, of extending what their business can offer farmers as well. Are there any other questions? Can we, get, can we get a mic? Raise, raise your hand so they can see. There's a mic. Not knowing when the next time we're going to see $7 corn. Um, with different crops that are being produced right now. I'm curious what direction you think the alternative crops and alternative fuels area is gonna go. You know, what, what different ways can we produce fuel for the world, producing food, um, different technologies that are going with that. What direction do you think it's gonna go? What technologies are you working with? What crops are you developing? So uh, there are the number of crops, there is how, a crop is produced. Uh, when you go into the grocery store here in town and you go to the egg portion, you'll be able to buy eggs for 88 cents a dozen, all up to four, they're all eggs. Uh, but how they were produced make a difference. There's gonna be a world soon where consumers will pay you even for growing corn differently. How much carbon did you sequester on that? How, how many units of N did you take to produce a bushel of, uh, of, of corn? And uh, there are consumers on both coasts that are very interested in this in a big way. And so how something is pr produced is, uh, is important and connecting that to the consumers that want it, it's big. Then there's the other crops. Uh, Scott mentioned uh, cover crops. Uh, cover crops could, could replace some, if not much, of the nitrogen necessary. And so those are, they're, they're, we're, we're doing that research now. As far as alternative crops up here, I'm not aware uh, of us working on any. Uh, more how and connecting those with consumers that will pay more for it. And so we already have, in wheat, we're, we're getting a premium for wheat. Uh, and we so no, see no reason we can't do it in the other crops. You know, I think another avenue is um, corn is the most efficient photosynthetic factory to make starch heat-driven. Wheat tends to be cool-driven. On oil and protein, soybeans is the most efficient, heat-driven, canola, cool-driven. So I think one of the things that we're gonna see is through technologies like CRISPR, those type of things where we can upregulate or downregulate different, different pathways, metabolic pathways, we'll be able to program those plants to make more of one thing, less of another. And I think we'll take the, the adaption of those factories and just have them produce different things based on new technologies that, that change what they make. But the factory itself is still the most efficient. We have time for one last question. Well, I have one. What's your prediction for where GMO is headed? I think we'll continue to see the segregation 
uh, because we do have the effluence both here and growing around the world to be able to afford more expensive food like organic. One of the challenges that we face as U.S. farmers is the regulatory approval delays that inhibit us from being able to plant the crops that can help make us the most efficient and make us the most money. And so if we could fix the system worldwide by recognizing that U.S. grain comes in three silos, basically. There's biotech developed corn, non-GMO corn, and organic corn. Organic is the most expensive, non-GMO is in the middle, and biotech corn is the least expensive way of producing food. And so that's the grain that U.S. offers, and the, qu the quicker we can get to a regulatory approval system where we can ship that grain based on U.S. approvals and not waiting on other countries to approve that, because we do have choice, we've got non-GMO or we've got organic, if they don't want biotech, that can also add to the farmer's bottom line question that you had about the reason why we're not getting as much for our grain is because some of these markets are being held up. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about the acceptance of GMOs in the future from, from, from the world. You know, sometimes it seems somewhat bleak. Um, and I, I also think without a doubt we will have to have them to cost effectively move forward in some cases. In some cases we won't, but, but in many cases uh, without them, it would be really, really difficult to produce uh, what we need to produce cost effectively. Just couldn't do it. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think eventually society gets it right. And there's always decisions of, you know, puts and takes. You know, we've got 10 billion people to feed. History of mankind is hungry people do desperate things. Right, including killing their neighbors for food. And, you know, um, the, the, the other piece of that is that, you know, to feed the people, all technology is going to be needed. Biotechnology is a piece of that. And, of course, science, hopefully, at one point in time, drives it. And as we all know, there hasn't been one person on the planet sick yet from consuming biotechnology food. Biotechnology addresses big problems, and until we have alternatives that fix those problems, it's going to, you know, it's going to be necessary. Uh, clearly, consumers, uh, there's a bunch of consumers out there that don't like it, so there's an opportunity for outside of that. Uh, but farmers have big problems that have to be fixed. Well, thank you guys so much. I think that's our time. Thank you. Yeah.